Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Carmela Santana automatically nodded and uttered words of thanks to those who had come to accompany her husband Javier on his final journey. The faces of even well-known people, blurred by tears that kept welling up, resembled indistinct spots. The turmoil of images irritated her, evoking the strongest desire to run away as far as possible from sympathetic words and pitiful looks, to hide somewhere and calmly try to comprehend what had happened. Javier had been blessed with robust health, led a healthy lifestyle, and knew how to enjoy life without turning the care of his body into fanatical adherence to diets. As far as Carmela knew, her husband had never smoked, drank very moderately, and preferred quality over quantity. Occasionally, once a week or even two weeks, he would work out at the fitness club. In general, he could have lived on, but an unfortunate coincidence in a single moment shattered the well-being of the Santana family. Javier had slightly exceeded the speed limit on an empty road. The wet road after the rain exacerbated the consequences of this violation, leading to a car accident. The car was not discovered in the ditch right away. Later, someone, thinking that Melita couldn't hear, shared the opinion that if they had brought Javi to the hospital earlier, his chances of recovery would have been higher. According to specialists, the remnants of the car were beyond repair. However, the robust body of the 33-year-old man fought for his life, astonishing doctors who had seen much. Carmela, whom they certainly didn't allow into the intensive care unit, in a fit of despair wandered among the nearby churches, prayed before the crucifix, begging them not to take her husband away. Unfortunately, no miracle occurred. Javé fought with the bony Grim Reaper for two days, but lost. By a strange coincidence, at that very moment, Carmela was nearing the hospital. She stumbled, fell flat on the ground, and scraped her knee. The throbbing pain was forgotten within moments, right after the tragic news of her husband's death. Although Carmela saw her husband's lifeless, cold body and chose items for his burial from the funeral agent's offerings, she could not believe in the reality of the sad event. When the first clumps of earth rustled on the crimson-clothed lid, Carmela wanted to tightly shut her eyes, then open them and realize that burying her beloved husband was just a reflection of her hidden fear of losing him. However, everything was real, the rapidly growing mound of clay soil under the strokes of shovels, the cross with a tablet that neatly accommodated all of Javé's life between two dates drawn by a thin line, and the memorial feast filled with the voices of dozens of people. Spoons clinked, cafeteria workers rushed back and forth with plates, someone said something, but for the young widow, it all blended into an incomprehensible and irritating cacophony. Close to her husband, Melita felt herself like behind a stone wall, and now she was experiencing a strange range of emotions. Overwhelming grief, flooding the woman's heart, mixed with burning resentment towards the cruel and unjust fate that had taken away her main support in life. Through what seemed like a thick layer of cotton, fragments of phrases about how Javé was a good person, reliable, and responsible reached her. However, kind words only caused her intense pain. She was angry with her husband, who had gotten into the accident due to his own overconfidence. The woman felt incredibly ashamed of this illogical feeling, which was quickly replaced by confusion. Carmela didn't know how she could go on living without her beloved husband. Their married life had been so harmonious that she hadn't regretted her decision to marry Javi for a single second and had hoped for a long life together. However, ironically, fate mocked her and her beloved suddenly left her. It was incredibly painful. The man left so suddenly, young and in the prime of his life, without even having the chance to enjoy what he had achieved and the cherished dreams that had become a reality. In their seven years of happy marriage, Carmela and her husband had bought a comfortable one-story house in the countryside, not far from the city. On their 0.3-acre plot, they had space for a log sauna, a relaxation area, and several small vegetable patches. The couple had already been considering expanding their family. Some days before their wedding, they had openly discussed and decided that they would become parents only after Melita matured enough for it. She knew all too well what problems came with children. However, it so happened that shortly after celebrating her first round birthday, her mother and stepfather had a son, Antonio, followed by a daughter, Violetta, a year later. The girl didn't mind looking after her half-siblings. 
Due to her deep sympathy for her mother, who hardly ever got enough sleep and had turned from a vibrant, cheerful woman into a withered shadow with sunken eyes and protruding collarbones, Melita took on a significant portion of typical household tasks. She laundered clothes before putting them in the washing machine, hung and ironed the bed linens and the children's clothes, fetched baby food, rocked the fussy and uncomprehending little relatives, took them for walks, and performed other tasks just so her mother could get some sleep, take a shower, or eat in peace. Melita's biological father paid meager child support, and the burden of providing for the rapidly growing family fell mainly on her stepfather. As a rule, they could only dream of any delicious indulgences or expensive entertainment. However, the girl didn't complain, as she didn't consider herself an unfortunate stepchild in the true sense of the word. Her stepfather, whom she called Uncle Alex, treated her kindly and never made distinctions, giving gifts to her and his biological children alike. Mother, having recovered after Vivi's birth, regained her former self. She tried to distribute her love equally among all the children and was incredibly grateful to her eldest daughter for her support and patience, as it was actually Carmelita who had the hardest time back then. The girl managed not to fall behind in her studies and did not harden her heart towards shorties, as she generically called Antonio and Viola. Carmela had a good relationship with her brother and sister, but having experienced the difficult maternal role since childhood, she didn't feel ready to give her beloved husband a child. Besides, both she and Javier wanted the best conditions for their future baby. And now, when this point in their life plan was approaching realization, everything changed so abruptly, unfairly, irreversibly. There was happiness, dreams, plans, both long-term and just for the upcoming weekends, and then suddenly, it all came to an end. At the memorial table, Carmela ate something without even tasting the dishes served in the dining room. After hastily saying goodbye to everyone who came to bid farewell to Javier, the woman, accompanied by her mother, returned to the empty house and went to the shower, where she cried without restraint. Tears mixed with water droplets, carrying them away without diminishing the pain. It took Carmela a few minutes to realize that she had forgotten to turn on the gas boiler and she was standing under a cold stream. Exiting the shower, the frozen woman, without even drying her hair, collapsed onto the bed. Her caring mother covered the widowed daughter with a blanket and gently stroked her back, trying to comfort her. Having warmed up, Carmela fell asleep and lay like that until morning, almost without moving and without any dreams. The morning of the new day promised her no joy. She acted as if on autopilot and constantly remembered Javier, what he would say, what he would do right now, in this moment. For nine days, her mother, who had taken two weeks off, stayed with her daughter. She saw her off to work and met her there, almost forcing her to have breakfast and dinner. In the evenings on weekdays, they worked together in a small garden, clearing the cultivated plants of weeds. These monotonous actions, of course, couldn't calm her, but at least they distracted her from gloomy thoughts. Summer, indifferent to human sorrow, wafted with the scent of blooming flowers, and Raquel watched her daughter with concern as she had almost stopped smiling. Alejandro, Antonio, and Viola came to visit them several times, but family gatherings, rather than coming, irritated the hostess of the house. Carmela understood that her relatives wished her well, but the need to restrain her grief took too much strength. The woman didn't want to see anyone, she struggled to participate in general conversations. Conversations about organizing the rapidly approaching memorial service caused almost tangible physical pain. After the memorial service, Carmela said, Mom, thank you for everything, but you should probably go home. You are needed by Antonio, Vivi, and Uncle Alex. And it's time for you to go to work, and it's not very convenient to commute from here. Raquel tried to object to her daughter, but Carmela began to persuade her. Don't worry, I'll manage on my own. I'll be good and won't forget to eat properly in the mornings and evenings. Almost grown-up kids and Uncle Alex have probably missed you. I feel awkward taking you away from the family for so long. In general, everything will be fine with me. Raquel, looking into her daughter's eyes, decided to believe her because, in reality, Antonio, who was experiencing his first crush, and Viola, who had managed to break her arm while riding a bike, 
needed attention now. Closing the door behind her mother, Carmelo was left alone in the house, which was destined to be a happy family nest. The woman's desperate grief was replaced by a deep apathy, indifference to everything and everyone. At her once beloved job, she still performed her duties, but without the enthusiasm that her superiors and colleagues were used to. She communicated with her relatives by phone and sometimes met them during lunch breaks. Her mother, stepfather, brother, and sister had offered Carmela several times to move in with them for a while, but she flatly refused the idea. The grieving woman felt that she had no right to leave the house, which she had passionately and lovingly turned into an ideal home with her husband. However, gradually, Carmela's mood began to change. She avoided staying inside the house, but she also couldn't bring herself to move far away from it. It became increasingly difficult for her to be alone with gloomy thoughts, but she had no intention of asking someone to keep her company. Her brother and sister had their teenage activities. It was inconvenient for her mother to commute to work, and she had already taken care of her during the most tragic period. Since her mother-in-law, Sonora Torres, started to cry as soon as she crossed the threshold of her son's house, Melita didn't dare to ask for her help and felt the taste of loneliness in full. Of course, long phone conversations with relatives and friends partially helped, but the widowed woman still tried to spend as much time as possible in the garden or on the veranda of the house until the evening chill forced her to cross the threshold of the empty home. The dawns hurried to replace the sunsets. It was hot during the day, like in summer, but in the early morning and evenings, one could already feel the approach of autumn. However, the bitterness in Carmela's heart did not leave her. She realized that the common phrase that time heals was just a comforting deception. Of course, the acute sense of irreparable loss dulled, but it didn't disappear. The woman gradually got rid of her indifference to the world around her, began to pay attention to work details that required special attention, and stopped on her way home, desperately hoping to see light in the windows, dreaming that her husband, healthy and unharmed, would be waiting for her inside their lovingly arranged home. She understood in her mind that she would have to get used to living without Javi now and interrupted herself when she started to imagine that they would one day announce that there had been a mistake and someone else had died in his car instead of her husband. After all, who knows what could have happened on the road. Sometimes Carmela deeply regretted that she and Javi had postponed expanding their family because a child would be her salvation and the meaning of life now. However, the woman tried not to delve too deeply into these feelings because she herself understood their complete futility. Nothing could be changed, only way out left was to learn how to live without her husband. Household chores required constant attention, but only after the 40th day since Javier's passing did Carmela manage to ascend to the attic. Her husband had set up a kind of study for himself there, where he spent a long time indulging in his favorite hobby. He built model ships, and Carmela was not forbidden from entering her husband's domain. She herself did not want to disturb her beloved man's peace. Besides, he even cleaned up the attic himself, saying that Melita might accidentally throw away some important part. In general, Melita was completely fine with this arrangement. She understood that even in a marriage filled with great love, spouses could have their own hobbies. If Jave somehow found inner harmony in the attic, then why not? She always knew he was nearby and would come to her aid at the first request. However, Melita did not abuse this method, allowing her husband to enjoy his hobby in peace and quiet, and she rarely ventured into the attic. Her gardening and the rest of the housekeeping duties were enough to keep her occupied without intruding into this male domain. And now, with an inexplicable trepidation, she entered the territory where Javier had ruled just recently. It seemed to her that by going through the things touched by her husband's hands, she was bidding him farewell. Besides, various bills for utilities needed to be sorted out. Of course, she had a rough idea of how, when, and where all of this was done, but now, with auto payments from Jave's block card no longer possible, she needed to check if any debts had accumulated. And if they had, she had to settle them. Carmela stepped over the threshold of the attic, and she almost gave up on her plan. Her eyes stung, and a bitter lump rose in her throat, making it hard to breathe deeply. 
Melita closed her eyes, stood still for a moment, regaining her composure, then opened her eyes and managed to enter the room she had jokingly called her husband's lair in the past. She felt terrified, but she resolutely began to go through the contents of the drawers of the desk in search of the necessary documents. While sorting through the papers, Carmela spotted a plastic folder with several transparent sleeves. In one of them was a contract signed with a private care home for disabled individuals called Mercy. On the lines left for recording the client's data, her husband's full name was indicated. And Carmela had no doubt that Javier had filled in these details himself. The handwriting on the sheets was unmistakably his. Judging by the document's text, her late husband had been paying for the care of an unfamiliar woman named Emilia Vega Saiz in a rather expensive facility. Carmela couldn't recall any acquaintance with such name, and as far as she knew, Jave didn't have any relatives by that name either. The date of the contract and the neatly stored receipts in another sleeve indicated that her late husband had begun paying for the stay of this unknown woman even before they got married, and he continued to do so during their married life. At the same time when significant expenses for the house and property, according to their plans, had created a noticeable gap in their budget. They were not on the brink of poverty, of course, but they still tried to save. Although it was partly even foolish, Carmela's heart suddenly pierced by irrational jealousy. How can this be? While she refrained from small joys like visiting a cosmetologist or cultural outings, not to mention trips abroad, Jave annually contributed substantial sums for the stay of a certain Emilia Vega in an establishment with a kind name and draconian, uncharitable prices. However, what outraged her most was not the money irretrievably deposited into the Mercy account, but the fact that all of this was done secretly, without her consent or even simple notification. What would it have cost Javier to confess? So it is, my dear wife, I must help a person in a difficult life situation. This matter is settled and not subject to appeal. Yes, Melita would surely have started to inquire about the reasons for the untimely and completely unfashionable altruism, but she definitely wouldn't have forbidden it. Jave could not know this, but he never even mentioned his charity. Carmela felt a burning desire to get to the bottom of this situation, especially since the deadline for the next payment was approaching in about a month. And it was necessary to figure out what to do next with this unexpected agreement. Setting aside the folder with its mysterious contents, the widow continued to sort through her husband's papers, but her thoughts still returned to the discovered secret. Why was Javier hiding help to some woman from her? What was the reason for the secrecy of a person whom Carmela considered incredibly honest? Suspecting that her late husband's mother might know something about the mysterious Vega, Melita decided to visit her on the upcoming weekend. Who, if not Sonora Torres, would be in the know? Although their relationship was based on the principle of the cold peace is better than a hot war, the loss of the man they both loved miraculously eliminated most of their disagreements. Having warned about the visit in advance, Carmela headed to Sonora Torres's place. Being taught by her mother not to visit empty-handed, the woman made a quick stop at the store, buying some tasty sausage, cheese, jabata, which her mother-in-law preferred over all other types of bread, and her favorite cookies. The women exchanged polite phrases and started a leisurely conversation, setting the table together. More accurately, at first, it was exclusively Sonora Torres who talked. She complained to her daughter-in-law that her son had not appeared to her in her dreams yet, recounted that her health had been failing more and more after his premature departure, her heart ached, her blood pressure soared, and even, judging by some signs, problems with her thyroid gland had emerged. Sonora Torres shared her sad thoughts about how her life had now lost all meaning and didn't fail to reproach Melita. If only you and Jave had a child, I wouldn't feel so lonely. Now I'm left without any close relatives. What's the point of me wandering this earth? You're still young, you'll get married, you shouldn't grieve so much for Jave. You can have as many children as you want with your new husband. And here I am, completely alone, without any close people. I'll die, and there will be no one to continue the family line after me. Carmela bit her lip to keep from crying. Memories of her late husband and her mother-in-law's assumptions about her future personal life were piercing her heart. Waiting for her mother-in-law to get everything off her chest, Carmela, deciding that there was no point in beating around the bush, 
got straight to the point. Sonora Torres, who was Emilia Vega to Jave? A tense silence filled the room. Carmela, closely watching her mother-in-law, noticed her face twitch, and she understood that Sonora Torres, at the very least, was familiar with this name and surname. However, the silver-haired woman with a stylish haircut didn't rush to reveal anything. On the contrary, it seemed like she was trying to hide her unusual embarrassment as she began to cut the food brought by her daughter-in-law with exaggerated attention, even though the table was already abundant. Only when there was hardly any space left on the round table, free from various sized plates, did her mother-in-law sit down, gesturing for Carmela to join her, and admitted. Honestly, I hope never to hear about Emilia Vega again, let alone talk about her. It's unpleasant for me to remember anything related to her. But since you're asking about her, there must be a serious reason, and I can't keep silent. As if asking a rhetorical question, Sonora Torres put down her sugar-stirring spoon and looked straight into her daughter-in-law's eyes. Carmela nodded, not daring to admit that she had found a contract for the support of this Vega among her husband's papers. Her mother-in-law, clearly satisfied with her daughter-in-law's silent gesture, continued her story. In general, Emilia was Jave's first serious love. Perhaps you wouldn't mind if you knew about this story for your peace of mind. Although, I'll honestly admit, my involvement in my son's romantic affair played a negative role. I didn't like this Amelia from the very first moment I met her. She had a silly smile, as if apologizing, cheap clothing, strange lipstick color, a pile of bleached yellowish hair, and unrealistically large, cow-like eyes. Well, I didn't care about her appearance or her makeup skills, that's half the trouble. In her youth, proper handling of cosmetics could turn a toad into a beauty. And, I must admit, the girl had quite attractive facial features, touching and captivating in some way. But as a person, she was completely unsuitable for my son. I thought so then, and I'm not going to change my opinion now. This girl hadn't even finished the ninth grade in school, and then she went through short courses to become a saleswoman at some strange center. Of course, the profession is necessary, but she showed no desire for self-improvement. She was perfectly content with her narrow outlook, like a snail, and, as she herself admitted in our conversation, reading books bored her. Jave noticed this Amelia in some small store when he was on a trip with his friends to the countryside. They were heading to someone's summer house and decided to buy lemons on the way because it was hot, and they wanted to make lemonade in addition to kebabs. They stopped at some stall on the way, and that's where Emilia was working. And my Jave fell in love with her, goodness knows what. Emilia Vega's genetics were, to put it mildly, peculiar, and to be honest, quite problematic. She had never seen her father, and her mother had almost lost parental rights for all four children, including the eldest Emilia when she was ten years old. Somehow, their wretched mother managed to convince the guardianship authorities that she would change her ways, but she just started going out less. Emilia used to tell me how she had to snatch food from the table, which was served as an appetizer, or there was a chance they'd go half-hungry for several days. And to my horror, Javier seemed to ignore such a terrible hereditary background, and he wasn't even bothered by the fact that this Emilia had a child born out of wedlock. She bragged with some marginal pride that she gave birth to her daughter Claudia when she was only 16. She said that her decision not to get rid of the child was the right one in her whole life, and thanks to the girl, she was genuinely needed by at least one person in the world, without any double thoughts. When asked about the child's father, Emilia brushed it off, saying it was a romantic fling of youth, and she didn't want to have anything to do with that joker, and being a single mother even had more benefits. I almost grabbed my head at such a statement. But Amelia, it seemed, didn't care about anything. She continued to brag, delighting in the fact that her Claudia attended kindergarten, already knew many letters, sang and danced. My goodness, forgive me, but on the evening of our meeting, I listened to my Jave's beloved and couldn't believe that all of this was happening in reality. How could my smart, educated, erudite son not understand that this was a simple woman, a single mother, completely unsuitable for him? Well, the difference in social status didn't bother me. I don't suffer from snobbery. Amelia certainly wasn't to blame for not being born with a silver spoon in her mouth. 
Her mother's lifestyle, who gave birth to children either for benefits or out of lack of common sense, didn't affect her daughter. Although, undoubtedly, there's nothing good to see and learn in such an environment. And it wasn't this dubious heredity that bothered me when I thought about my son's future with this woman the most. Most of all, it was Amelia's unhealthy arrogance that irritated me. This arrogance of a young, insolent hussy, confident in her irresistibility, just upset me. Moreover, she dared to answer me firmly, without choosing her words and not fearing to come off as rude when I asked about their living conditions. This Amelia giggled and laughed when she told me that Jave promised her they would rent an apartment because, I quote, she didn't want to share the same kitchen with her mother-in-law. It's hard to imagine, but Javier didn't react to such an attack on me in any way. When I learned the details of Amelia's life, I had a hypertensive crisis. After all those sleepless nights when Javier was sick, I took care of him, made him study, and advance in his career. Why would he take on the yoke of an uneducated, rude woman and someone else's child? Of course, one could argue that Amelia wasn't to blame for becoming what she had to be, and if she had a different character, she wouldn't have survived there. But it didn't make me feel any better, and I even refused hospitalization. Where could I go if Javier was about to get married and announced that they had already filed a marriage application at the registry office? Sonora Torres fell silent. It was obviously not easy for her to recall the past, and Melita didn't dare to rush the woman, who was looking pensively at a sandwich, as if deciding whether she wanted to eat it or not. Soon, Sonora Torres continued. Jave and Emilia's romance developed, and they even visited me with little Claudia. But my opinion about this mismatch didn't change. The girl, of course, wasn't to blame for her mother hanging on my son, but I couldn't bring myself to even try to be affectionate or encouraging towards her. I listened as Jave, Emilia, and even little Claudia discussed the details of the upcoming wedding, and with horror, I thought that soon my son would be ensnared, he'd have to bend over backward to establish a family life, and my obvious protest could lead to a rift between us. I was horrified. But fate had other plans, and a tragedy occurred that even made me, despite my antipathy towards Amelia, feel sorry for her. On that day, she went to her troubled neighborhood to get her things, take her daughter, and then permanently return to the city center. Jave couldn't accompany her because he needed to go on a business trip. He asked Amelia to wait for him, to postpone her departure until his return, but she couldn't wait to leave the wretched area of her usual existence. For her, moving into an apartment rented by my son was a grand event, and the upcoming marriage was a real winning ticket, seemingly obtained entirely by chance. How else could it be? An uneducated simple woman, but with a child, caught the eye of a man like Javier. Besides, her daughter was growing up, and who, if not Amelia, would know how free, if not loose, the morals were there. In general, an official marriage for a young single mother from a troubled family was practically a Cinderella story in a modern version. I thought she clung to my son only because he could become her stepping stone to a normal life. Later, Jave blamed himself for not convincing Emilia to wait a bit longer. After all, he could have gone with her to get their meager belongings and her daughter together in just one or two days, and most likely, the tragedy could have been avoided. But it happened as it happened. A terrible disaster occurred, one that you wouldn't even wish on your worst enemy. Emilia's mother, you can only call her that with sarcasm, threw a party before parting with her daughter and granddaughter, basically using any reason as an excuse for drinking. As the investigation later revealed, one of the invited guests fell asleep with a cigarette. The house was in poor condition, a wooden shack nestled on the outskirts of a private sector. The worst part was that the drunks who had fallen asleep on the veranda survived. Emilia, her sisters, and her daughter found themselves trapped. In the chaos, not everyone survived, and Claudia and one of her aunts fell victims to the fire. Emilia, in her attempts to save her daughter and sisters, suffered burns and a trauma that left her unable to walk, not to mention the incredible shock. Horrifying, of course. The surviving sisters exacerbated the nightmare situation by blaming Amelia for the party and the house fire. They even came to their apartment to demand compensation from Jave for the fire. Can you imagine the audacity? 
Their niece had died, their sister was in the hospital, and yet they shamelessly approached Emilia's fiancé to push money away from him. I chased them away, and, to be honest, I secretly rejoiced that fate had saved me from such relatives. I'm telling you all this now, and a shiver runs down my spine. It's such a horrifying tragedy that it's hard to imagine, and yet I feel joy in my heart. Jave behaved like a real man and ignored all my attempts to keep him. He visited Amelia in the hospital and was determined to marry his beloved, even though she rejected him, with my guidance, but my son never found out about that. I even knelt before this Amelia, begging her not to ruin my son's life and to refuse to marry him, and somehow, I found the words to convince her not to jeopardize his future. The wedding was canceled, and my son seemed to calm down. It's a sin, of course, but I was happy that Javier didn't tie his life to a woman who wasn't suitable for him. You, Melita, don't think I'm a monster. I reproached myself for feeling this joy. My son never spoke to me about Amelia again, and I thought I'd never hear her name again. When he married you, I was absolutely delighted. You immediately appealed to me, well-mannered, modest, hard-working, without the burden of a child. In general, I thought that the story with Amelia was a thing of the distant past, and here you are asking about her. So, I hurried to relieve my soul of this burden. The matter is, of course, long past, but I feel somewhat lighter now. The story of her husband's tragic first love deeply moved Carmela to her core. She understood that, contrary to her mother and secretly from her, Javier continued to care for the one who had rejected him. It's entirely possible that Amelia never confessed to him that she had declined the wedding only at the earnest request of her beloved's mother. Out of some heightened sense of nobility, something hard to imagine in someone raised in such a clearly troubled environment, she didn't want to impose herself on Javier in her fragile state. It seemed Emilia was not a gold digger, but a true loving woman. After the heavy confession, the mother-in-law seemed to lose her appetite. She sipped her now cold coffee from her cup, completely ignoring the treats on the table. Carmela, not knowing what to say, also remained silent, lost in thought. Sonora Torres's next question caught her off guard. Melita, why did you even ask about Amelia? Did she call or somehow make herself known? For some reason, Carmela couldn't bring herself to tell the truth. She felt that if Jave had kept this secret, she had no right to reveal it. She had to come up with something and try not to deviate too far from the truth. Well, I happened to read about her on one of the notes, and it got me curious. After all, curiosity isn't a vice, as they say, but rather a great thing. I'm really sorry, Sonora Torres, if I unintentionally upset you. Please forgive me. I think I'll go home now. My head is starting to ache. Sonora Torres seemed almost relieved that her future daughter-in-law was about to leave and didn't try to persuade her to stay a little longer. On her way home, Carmela tried to cope with her emotions and avoid getting irritated. First and foremost, she felt hurt. Did her husband really not trust her enough to share this part of his life? His nobility towards the unfortunate woman he had planned to marry, but who he couldn't do to tragic circumstances, only painted him in a positive light. Did he think so little of her that he feared jealousy towards Amelia or resentment about the money spent on the nursing home? Carmela used to believe that giving Javier his personal space was the right thing to do, but it turned out that he had created a chasm between them even without that, through the carefully guarded secret. However, she couldn't ask him now and find out why he thought his lawful wife didn't need to know about providing comfortable living conditions for his former fiancé. When Carmela returned home, she was determined to visit the nursing home as soon as possible. She needed to not only figure out how to continue paying for Emilia's care, but also, perhaps, inform her about Javier's passing. After all, their past had linked them together, and delivering such sad news would be the right thing to do. It would surely cause her some unpleasant emotions, but it wouldn't be fair or humane to leave the unfortunate woman in the dark. In memory of her husband, Carmela had decided not to abandon his former fiancé, but their financial situation hinted that she would need to find a solution. Overall, the idea of visiting the nursing home filled Carmela with a certain amount of fear and sometimes even outright panic. She feared both potential bureaucratic hurdles and Amelia's negative reaction. 
Additionally, she dreaded the upcoming negotiations with the leadership of Mercy about extending the payment period for their services. The somber ceremony had practically wiped out their savings, and making a payment for an entire year up front was almost impossible. Nevertheless, Carmela gathered her courage and, after checking the visiting hours and scheduling an appointment with the facility's director, set off on her journey. Mercy, whose photos the woman had carefully studied on the internet, made a pleasant impression on her in reality as well. Tall pine trees surrounding the small, seemingly cozy buildings gave her a sense of security. The air was fresh with a subtle scent of resin, evoking thoughts of something elevated, pure, and eternal. Taking a deep breath, Carmela went to meet with the director. There was no one in the reception area. After knocking on the door and hearing an invitation to enter, Carmela peered into a small office. The young woman sitting in front of a computer monitor asked, Hello, what can I help you with? There were no photos of the director on the website. Carmela thought that the person in front of her was an assistant or a secretary. The visitor didn't imagine the director of the institution this way and explained that she needed to talk to Maria Herrera Flores about Emilia Vega, who was in the nursing home. The woman, who turned out to be the director, nodded warmly. Please come in. I was informed that you planned to visit today. I'm listening. Trying to speak as calmly as possible, Carmela explained that her late husband used to pay for the care of a patient named Emilia Vega, and she mentioned some financial difficulties. Sonora Herrera, from what I've seen, your facility indeed provides the most comfortable conditions, and I understand that everything comes at a cost. It just so happened that I won't be able to pay for an entire year up front. Maybe you can accept payments on a monthly basis? It seemed this admission didn't shock the director of the nursing home at all. She smiled. Generally, if you pay for the whole year, we offer a discount, and it turns out to be a bit less expensive than paying monthly. However, I think we can find a solution and adjust the amount toward a reduction with monthly payments. Besides, to be honest, Sonora Vega receives very thorough care from my staff and doesn't need much assistance. She's quite capable of taking care of herself and even helps the staff with some tasks. She's a wonderful woman with a very strong character. By the way, if you'd like, you can meet with her. Would you like to? Carmela nodded, realizing that the amount was still significant for her budget. She decided to leave everything as it was for now. After completing the new contract, Sonora Herrera personally escorted the visitor to a large room referred to as the game room by the director. In the spacious, well-lit room, the residents of the nursing home engaged in various activities. Some played chess and checkers, while others filled out bingo cards. Several people, including a fairly young man, were knitting, sitting closer to the gleaming windows. Sonora Herrera introduced the visitor to one of the craftswomen who was sitting in a wheelchair. The former fiancé of her late husband didn't look the way Carmela had imagined her from her mother-in-law's description. Emilia's chestnut hair was cut short and she wore no makeup. Her huge eyes seemed to take up a significant portion of her face and there was a noticeable burn scar on her left cheek, but it wasn't repulsive. Overall, Vega appeared rather attractive to Carmela. Breaking away from her knitting, Emilia looked at the director and the guest and greeted them. Sonora Herrera introduced the women to each other and offered, If you'd like, you can talk in the little park outside or in a room, whichever is more convenient for you. Emilia set aside her knitting into a box on the windowsill and said, Sonora Herrera, it's probably better outside. Carmela followed Emilia, who skillfully handled her wheelchair. As she walked, she thought that perhaps she had started all of this for no reason. A conversation with a woman whom Javier had once loved promised to be quite difficult. Emilia had flinched sharply upon hearing the familiar surname of the visitor. The two women reached a bench located away from the central alley and the buildings in complete silence. Once they arrived, Emilia, as if assuming the role of a hostess, invited Carmela to sit down and asked, so, judging by the last name, I understand that you're Javier's wife. Carmela nodded, trying to find the right words to tell Emilia about the man's passing, a man they both had loved. 
However, her interlocutor spared her from this difficult task, simply and bitterly uttering. I knew it. Something irreparable happened to Jave. Despite having to reject him, he always acted like a true man. This wonderful place was assigned to me, where it's peaceful and comfortable. I'm deeply sorry about Jave. It's just incredible. About a month and a half ago, he came to me in a dream, as if to say goodbye. He promised to watch over my Claudia. I immediately understood that he had left the world of the living. From my own experience, I know that words of condolences don't provide much comfort, but believe me, I fully share your grief. Javier was the best person I ever met on my path. I always wished him nothing but happiness, which I couldn't give him. I'm incredibly sorry that such a bright person has left this world forever. Carmela looked with surprise into the eyes of the woman sitting across from her in a wheelchair and realized that she truly felt what she was saying. Emilia didn't offer hollow condolences. This woman, who had gone through terrible trials and, at the request of her potential mother-in-law, had turned away from happiness as the wife of her beloved, genuinely understood her. Carmela involuntarily pondered that if it weren't for Sonora Torres's intervention, Javier, Emilia, and her deceased daughter could have lived together happily. A lump rose in her throat as she thought of this. She understood that she was on the verge of tears, so she hurried to say her goodbyes. Emilia, you understood everything correctly. Javier is indeed no longer with us. It was an accident, a tragedy, and it seems that no one is to blame. But it doesn't make it any easier. Let me help you get back to your building. Emilia declined, and Carmela almost rushed out of the nursing home. She only caught her breath in the taxi's back seat. As she observed the passing cars, traffic lights, houses, trees, and people, she thought about how to help Emilia. In her musings about this unfortunate woman, who had endured much more difficulties than she had, Melita managed to divert her thoughts from her own sorrow. After leaving the nursing home, she decided to visit her mother and share the latest news. After all, Raquel still didn't know about the discovery Melita had made in her late husband's hideaway or about the trip. Listening to her daughter, the woman raised her eyebrows in surprise. I could never even imagine that Javier could present such a surprise. Although, in general, he acted quite decently, he didn't abandon poor Emilia, he didn't trouble you with information about his past relationships, and he didn't upset his mother, understanding that she wouldn't approve of helping his former fiancé, especially after the tragedy. Sonora Torres probably shouldn't have interfered in Javier's personal life. But what's done is done, and it's useless to speculate about how things could have been if Emilia had become his bride. Understanding that her daughter was in shock from the situation, Raquel interrupted her speech and resorted to a tried and true method for dealing with stress. She fed Carmela homemade food. Varia, who had returned home, lightened the atmosphere further. The immediate, cheerful young woman distracted her older sister and their mother from their gloomy thoughts by sharing funny stories. Leaving her mother's apartment, Carmela was in a much more balanced mood. Support from loved ones truly had a beneficial effect. In her home, as she ascended to the attic, the woman sat in a comfortable chair that seemed to retain the contours of her husband's body. As she examined the details of the unfinished model, she spoke into the void. What should I do with all of this now? If I pay for Emilia's stay at the nursing home on a permanent basis, I won't have the resources, but leaving her without help somehow doesn't feel humane. Or should I reassure myself that this unfortunate woman is nobody to me personally and forget about her? Carmela didn't have answers to these questions. She didn't consider herself a villain or a saint, but she found it hard to shake off thoughts of Emilia. There was something very touching about this woman with large eyes. Perhaps, in memory of her husband, who had cared for his former fiancé, Carmela felt obligated to carry on the legacy. On the other hand, not every woman in her position would be able to show such generosity, especially when the financial burden of this noble act threatened her own comfort. Clearly, she couldn't pay for Amelia's stay at the private nursing home for long, and finding a more affordable facility would likely mean sacrificing some level of comfort. She needed to come up with a solution, and she needed to do it soon. For now, she decided to at least continue visiting Amelia. 
Carmela started going to the nursing home regularly. She herself didn't understand how, at some point, these visits, at least twice a month, became a habit for her. Surprisingly, despite their shared memory of the same man, nothing else seemed to connect them. Talking about Javier scratched at both of their barely healed wounds, but their conversations became more pleasant and confidential over time. Before the New Year holidays, Carmela, along with her stepfather, mother, and even her younger brother and sister, went to Mercy because it was problematic to transport several heavy bags of gifts without a personal car. The man whom Carmela now often called by his first name without adding uncle didn't harbor any resentment towards his stepdaughter for having to go out of town. Raquel noticed that visits to the nursing home helped Melita cope with the profound sense of loss for Javier, and she easily persuaded her husband to go together with them. However, most of the time, the young widow visited Amelia and the other residents she had become acquainted with alone. Conversations with people living in comfortable conditions, but restricted in their mobility, turned out to be a salvation for Carmela. The unexpected thoughts and experiences of the nursing home residents helped her see different facets of life in a new light. Emilia once confessed to the widow of her beloved man. Can you imagine, there isn't a day that goes by when I don't think of my little daughter and wonder what would have happened if I had listened to Javi and postponed my trip to my mother's. But more and more often, I feel that the tragedy that befell me didn't happen just by chance, but for some kind of development. It's probably funny to hear this from a fairly young woman confined to a wheelchair. But it's within the walls of this nursing home that I've grown as a person. I've started self-educating here, reading books, and not just superficially, but thoughtfully. And they've also taught me to do handicrafts here. Of course, I didn't succeed right away, but then I suddenly caught some kind of fantastic enthusiasm. Isn't it amazing and wonderful when a real thing emerges from yarn and simple tools? Upon Emilia's recommendation, Carmela herself tried to get involved in the world of crafts. The new experience was interesting. Furthermore, her interactions with Emilia and the new acquaintances, who didn't lose their spirits after encountering monstrous challenges, helped Carmela to perceive her own pain in a more detached way. Even though Mercy provided excellent conditions, being effectively confined there was still quite a tough ordeal. She could do whatever she wanted, while the residents of the nursing home had to adhere to the facility's schedule. On a pre-holiday spring day, Carmela asked for permission to leave work an hour earlier and set off on her familiar route, making sure to stop by for delicious treats in addition to the lovely gifts. There were more visitors than usual on this pre-holiday day, and everyone seemed to be in especially high spirits. However, Carmela felt like cats were scratching at her soul because her bonus had unexpectedly been reduced at work. Unfortunately, there were no signs of the situation improving, and the prospect of ending up with a meager salary brought about unpleasant emotions. She thought she should talk to Sonora Herrera about it, but she didn't want to spoil her festive mood. In theory, there should have been some compensation for Amelia regarding the burned-down house. She probably deserved some square footage, but it was far from easy to broach the subject. Sad memories could have a detrimental effect on Amelia's health, and Melita didn't want to upset her. When Amelia asked if everything was okay, Carmela reassured her, but she knew that she couldn't afford to pay for the nursing home services for long given the circumstances. The idea of bringing Amelia into her home, not as a friend perhaps, but as a good companion, crossed her mind. A home that had been built for a happy family life with Javier. However, making such drastic changes was not easy, and the prospect of modifying the house to make it comfortable for a person in a wheelchair, as well as the realization that short visits were not the same as constant cohabitation, was daunting. After her conversation with Amelia, Carmela was on her way to the bus stop to get back to the city and then make her way home with transfers when a car pulled up next to her. The man behind the wheel looked familiar to her. She had often seen him at the nursing home, and as per the established tradition there, they would exchange greetings even though they had never been formally introduced. Carmela knew that he visited an elderly woman and thought he might want to discuss something related to that. However, instead, the man offered, If you're heading into town, hop in. It looks like snow clouds are gathering, despite it being the first week of spring. 
Perhaps due to fatigue or because the man didn't seem like a villain at all, especially visually, Carmela thanked him and agreed. A little later, settled in the car's passenger seat, she realized that the man, who introduced himself as Nicholas, simply needed someone to talk to. In response to her acknowledgement of his name, he confessed. You know, I placed my aunt in mercy. Honestly, I feel ashamed. She practically raised me, and here I am putting her in state care. Although I could have easily arranged for a caregiver to look after her and perform the necessary medical procedures, it wouldn't have been a problem for me, considering I work at a good private clinic and I have connections among medical professionals. However, when my cousin became unable to move on her own, she asked me herself to find a place where she could receive care and companionship. That's the only way I justify it to myself, especially since I have very little free time. The man fell silent for a moment and then asked, I apologize for being tactless, but do you have a sister at Mercy? I saw you with a young woman who was almost never idle. Carmilla couldn't help but smile. Both Amelia and Melita did share some elusive resemblance. Apparently, Javier had a preference for a certain type of woman and remained consistent. However, she didn't want to go into lengthy explanations, so she simply reassured her new acquaintance. It would probably be more accurate to say that I have a good friend at Mercy. However, Nicholas, you shouldn't worry. Thanks to Sonora Herrera and the team at Mercy, the conditions there are close to ideal. Of course, it's foolish to envy people who have lost their health, but in my opinion, the nursing home is wonderful. The air is healing, the facilities are clean, and there's always engaging company. So, don't worry, Nicholas. I believe your aunt is better off being among people rather than suffering in loneliness, waiting for the person you hired or for you to return from work. Nicholas looked attentively at his companion. She spoke so confidently that there was no doubt this was a well-thought-out position. Melita continued to express what had been weighing on her mind. The nursing home is an excellent place. The only downside is that it's not very affordable. But they don't take money from relatives in vain. Everything is fair. Besides, no matter how many times I've inquired, the residents are delighted with the Mercy team. Even today, on a holiday, when they probably want to get home earlier, they've organized a celebration. It's an informal approach, sincere and heartfelt. It's nice that such people with compassionate hearts work exactly where it's crucial. The man had no choice but to agree. He had heard only good reviews about the staff and the institution itself from his aunt. Engaged in conversation, they didn't notice how quickly time passed as they drove towards the city. Nicholas asked, Where do you live? I'm free today and can take you all the way there. Carmela felt embarrassed but confessed that she needed to go to the bus station to get to her countryside home. Nicholas decisively offered, Well, if you allow me, I'll take you straight there. It's not far and we can chat some more. Besides, I haven't had such a heartfelt conversation in a while. There were no traffic jams on the road, and soon Carmelo was waving goodbye to the departing car as Nicholas declined her polite offer to have coffee. I'm sorry, but I'll have to pass this time. Thank you for your company. It was important for me to hear your opinion, and you've reassured me greatly. Perhaps now my conscience won't bother me. Although Carmela couldn't even contemplate starting a new romance after her husband's death without an internal shudder, life continued to move forward, pushing her towards social interaction, including with people of the opposite sex. Nicholas appealed to her with his thoughtfulness, intelligence, and an incredible ability to empathize. Melita had no intention of beginning a new love story, but she appreciated the gallantry of her chance acquaintance. They met several times at the nursing home, exchanged polite greetings, and sometimes Nicholas would give her a ride to the bus station, her mother's apartment where she lived with her family, or even to her countryside home. The new acquaintance behaved with restraint, but Amelia soon noticed his attraction to Carmela. She admitted in a conversation, Please don't be upset, but I'll be direct with you. It seems that Nicholas, who visits Sonora Duran, has taken a liking to you. If you'd asked me, 
I'd say he's a reliable person, and you shouldn't turn down a chance for happiness, even if you don't interact with him romantically. Just smile at him, let him know you find him appealing. After all, you're not even 30 yet. I understand that you loved Javier, and you still do. Such feelings don't disappear, and death can't extinguish them. I went crazy over Javier myself, but life goes on. What's the point of refusing happiness? Carmela typically cuts short such unpleasant conversations, steering the discussion into neutral waters. Nevertheless, aside from Amelia, her mother also increasingly tried to convince her daughter not to remain trapped in her grief. Even Sonora Torres, when her daughter-in-law came to visit, occasionally broached the uncomfortable topic. I'm pleased that you remember my son, but he would surely be saddened to see you suffer like this. I understand that there's nothing you can do about this longing. My husband, Jave's father, tragically passed away when our son was barely 10 years old. I haven't looked at other men since. But, Melita, you know what I'll tell you, based on my experience, you can't bury yourself alive after your husband's death, it's not right. Alright, I at least had a son. Besides all my other fears, I was afraid of choosing the wrong stepfather for Jave. But you, Carmelita, you're all alone. That's not right. However, Carmela was less concerned about her personal life than about the impending financial troubles. The atmosphere at work was becoming increasingly tense, and the regular bonuses she used to receive had now become sweet memories. Among her colleagues, rumors of layoffs were circulating more persistently. What was once a friendly team had turned into something resembling a nest of spiders, as the management had suddenly started encouraging employees to report on each other. In her department, there were two women with children, and Carmela watched in sincere amazement as each of them meticulously recorded late arrivals and early departures, reporting them to the management with outraged exclamations and hushed complaints, accompanied by frantic typing on the computer keyboard. Their reporting disciplinary violations to the bosses, Santana surmised. However, she refrained from condemning her colleagues, as she had no intention of participating in this unfair game initiated by the management. Thanks to Sonora Torres, who had given up her share of the inheritance, Carmela didn't have to look for money to pay for her portion of the house and land. However, if she were to be laid off, financing Emilia's stay in the nursing home would become extremely difficult. Carmela's options were limited. She couldn't stop helping Emilia, as that would be akin to betrayal. So, she had to figure out how to navigate this situation with minimal disruptions to her life. She could invite Emilia to live with her, which would require some modifications to the house to accommodate someone in a wheelchair. Alternatively, she might have to sell the house, which was filled with reminders of Javier. She could then look for a more modest apartment, using the remaining money to cover the nursing home fees. However, this second option seemed like a losing proposition from all angles. Even if she put the difference in the bank and earned interest, the savings would eventually run out. And then what? She would have to downgrade her living conditions. The idea of possibly moving to the city was horrifying to Carmela. She had grown accustomed to being able to pick fresh herbs, cucumbers, or apples from the nearest garden rather than rushing to the store for them. It seemed more practical to invite Amelia to live with her. This would allow the unfortunate woman to continue breathing fresh air, even if it lacked the scent of pine trees from the nursing home grounds. She could also enjoy the benefits of natural produce. Of course, there would be less social interaction, but at least the walls would not be those of a state-run institution. Worried, Carmela shared her idea with her friend during their next meeting, anxiously awaiting her reaction. However, Amelia simply shrugged. You know, I understand that this is not a cheap institution, and I've occasionally thought about returning to my good-for-nothing mother's house. But that would be an undesirable option for me. I'm quite comfortable here, but I find myself yearning for something beyond this quiet existence more and more. So, if you think I won't be a burden to you, I'd be happy to move in with you, even if it's just for a short while, like a little vacation. And if it doesn't work out, I'm prepared to look for work with accommodation. Surely, I can find something. Carmelo was pleased that Amelia liked her idea. While the move might not be a straightforward process, they had reached a fundamental agreement. 
Carmela's family supported her initiative, but her mother-in-law, upon learning that Javier's former fiancé would soon be living in her son's house, unexpectedly opposed the idea. Sonora Torres came to visit her daughter-in-law and began the conversation without hesitation. Melita, you are a kind soul, and I don't blame you for that. It's probably a good thing that people like you still exist in this world. But why burden yourself with this? Emilia is already an adult woman with a terrible tragedy in her past. Clearly, she couldn't forget the nightmare she endured, and she probably has not only physical, but also psychological problems. In the nursing home, at least, she receives professional care and medical attention. Think about it, how do you plan to provide all of this? This is, after all, the countryside, even if it's not far from the city. But even getting to the hospital would take time. To Carmela's immense surprise, Sonora Torres became so agitated that she even began to cry. After calming down her mother-in-law with difficulty, Carmela, carefully choosing her words to avoid triggering another wave of tears, tried to explain. You see, Emilia is no longer the woman you met a long time ago. She went through a terrible ordeal but found the strength to develop and improve herself. Emilia is an excellent craftswoman, and she's a very interesting person to talk to. You know, if I were in her place, I would probably consider the whole world hostile and hold grudges against both you and her mother because of the tragedy. That's just my personality. But she, having lost all hope of happiness, living in a state-run institution, doesn't curse fate but instead lives her life as best as she can, bringing benefit to those around her. You know, Sonora Torres, this is incredibly valuable. You and Amelia need to get to know each other again. I believe that after talking to her, you'll understand that she's a person worthy of respect. Her mother-in-law listened attentively to Melita's objections and realized that she wouldn't be able to dissuade her. All that remained was to accept it. After all, if she didn't want to, no one and nothing would force her to interact with Amelia, so what was the point of discouraging her daughter-in-law from making a well-intentioned but burdensome decision? Amelia's departure from the nursing home was met with mixed feelings, even by its director, Sonora Herrera. While talking to Carmela, she confessed, I'm very sorry we have to prepare for this parting. You know, it's not the money you were paying that's important to me. We have no shortage of people willing to settle their loved ones here. I sincerely regret parting with Amelia. But, on the other hand, if I'm being honest, home conditions often help more than professional care. Besides, judging by the photos you showed me, Amelia will be comfortable at your place. I'll write you a note with contacts for doctors, pharmacies where you can buy care products, and I'll leave you my personal phone number. Call me if you need anything, I'll always help. Carmelo was grateful to Sonora Herrera for sharing such important information voluntarily. A positive attitude and belief that the move would go smoothly also persisted in Emilia. She felt that a new stage was beginning in her life, and this time it seemed genuinely calm and joyful, as far as her circumstances allowed. Upon learning of Amelia's move from his aunt, Nicholas immediately offered his assistance. I'll arrange for a car suitable for transporting your friend, and if there's any manual labor needed for preparation, I have acquaintances who are builders. They can set up ramps and take care of everything quickly and efficiently, at a reasonable cost. Carmela didn't hesitate to accept Nicholas's help. In fact, upon closer inspection, there were many shortcomings in the house that could hinder Emilia's mobility. They needed to get rid of door thresholds, rearrange furniture, and take care of numerous essential details. The workload was so extensive that panic sometimes set in. Remarkably, whenever it seemed that everything was going awry, and nothing was ready for Amelia's arrival, as if by the wave of a magic wand, all obstacles began to disappear. In the end, with the help of her family, Nicholas, and other people, the move took place. Even Sonora Torres, although clearly feeling out of place, paid a brief visit. Despite her unease, Amelia communicated with her without a hint of resentment. Everything went almost perfectly. A new chapter in the house that had become a refuge for the women Javier once loved began with lively commotion. Perhaps for the first time since the owner's funeral, laughter and jokes could be heard in the house. 
Raquel, observing her daughter, noted that she looked much better. At least, Carmela was once again as active and energetic as she was before her husband's death. The sad anniversary was approaching, and Carmela was relieved that this time she wouldn't be alone in the house. With Amelia by her side, it would be easier to discuss all the details of the upcoming memorial service and handle the organization together. Having Amelia in the house, a woman she barely knew in practical terms, didn't bother Carmela at all. She made sure that Amelia felt comfortable. As if in memory of Javier, Carmela carefully brought down a few ready-made ship models from the attic and proudly showed them. The simple-hearted Amelia even whistled in surprise and confessed. Javi used to tell me that he dreamed of building ships, but I had no idea he could create such works of art. It's incredible how talented he was. You know, I'm glad that at least during his married life with you, he got to pursue his hobbies. The days passed by swiftly. By mutual agreement, they decided to commemorate Javier's anniversary in one of the city's cafes, although Amelia had suggested celebrating it at home. Carmela said, Let's go, please. After all, if Javier cared about you after the breakup, it means you were important to him. Solving the challenge of transporting Amelia in her wheelchair to and from the cafe once again fell to Nicholas, who occasionally kept in touch with both Melita and Amelia, passing greetings from his aunt. He still didn't show any obvious romantic interest, leaving Carmela to wonder if his help was purely altruistic. Nevertheless, Carmela had more pressing concerns than trying to decipher the motives of a relatively unfamiliar person. At work, Carmela did experience layoffs, leaving her without a job. They did provide her with the old severance pay, but she couldn't relax. She had to browse job listings online, send out resumes, and attend interviews. A suitable opportunity remained elusive, but Melita wasn't giving up or settling for clearly unpromising positions. Bad times can't last forever, and they had a roof over their heads, some supplies in the cellar, and the garden was gradually rewarding their efforts. In general, with her ability to economize, they could get by for another month or two without much worry. As Nicholas was driving the women home after the memorial service, he inadvertently mentioned that his company was in need of a dispatcher and asked, Do you happen to know anyone reliable who could fit the bill? The salary isn't enormous, though. Carmela and Emilia exchanged silent glances. The figure he mentioned was quite decent, but he interpreted their silence somewhat differently. I understand it's not very lucrative, but the advantage is that you can work from home if you have a stable internet connection. Ask around among your acquaintances. It's a flexible schedule. If someone's interested, give them my phone number and I'll provide all the details. Carmela decided to respond immediately. Nicholas, there's really no need to ask around. I'd take that job, starting from tomorrow. Emilia didn't support her friend. Listen, Melita, I think it would be better if I at least started contributing the little. This vacancy is just right for me, and you really need some rest until you find a stable job. Nicholas, to whom these two resilient women had refrained from complaining about their lives, was quite surprised. Usually, whenever any of his acquaintances faced difficulties, they would turn to him for help. However, Melita and Emilia had entirely different principles, which he had noticed a while ago. He admired their independence, and, more importantly, their regard for him wasn't based on his financial capabilities. They simply weren't the type to seek out his resources and accepted help somewhat reluctantly. Such an approach was new to him. This time, he didn't refuse the invitation for coffee. During their conversation on the veranda, he explained the dispatcher's duties to Emilia and inquired about Carmela's education and work experience in detail. I'll ask around, maybe someone among my acquaintances knows a suitable place. After all, good positions like this one aren't usually offered to strangers off the street, Nicholas replied. The women thanked Nicholas profusely. Once he had left, Emilia scolded her friend. Carmela, why are you still ignoring him? It's time to move on from mourning. Look, you might miss out on a great man, and fate might not be so forgiving. Carmela, still saddened by the memorial service, responded with a huff. 
Listen, Emilia, I don't allow anyone to meddle in my personal life, and neither should you. If you like Nicholas, go for it, but I'm not interested. I'm still mourning Jave. Emilia quietly apologized and retreated to her room. She did feel guilty for crossing a line, and deep down, she did have strong feelings for Nicholas. Perhaps it was because of the glowing endorsement her loving aunt had given him. Sonora Duran was a talkative woman who had praised her nephew in the nursing home, using extravagant descriptions. Nicholas was indeed a dream come true. But how could she, bound to a wheelchair, hope to capture his attention? Nevertheless, she was grateful to him for helping her find a job. While Amelia did receive state benefits, she wanted to contribute more substantially to the household finances. Gradually, Nicholas started visiting their home more often, and he was always welcomed. Carmela had been keeping her distance since Javier's memorial service to avoid giving him false hope, while Amelia, with her full approval, was trying to spend more time with her boss. Amelia, with her charm, wasn't even diminished by the scar from the burn, and Nicholas noticed more and more that he was drawn to this lovely lady with large, expressive eyes. Compared to the cold and emotionally distant Carmela, Emilia was a volcano. Sometimes, he even forgot about her physical limitations. Then, he set a goal for himself, to find the best doctors for Emilia and make sure she could return to a more normal life. Observing the budding romance, Carmela was delighted. She wanted everything to work out harmoniously between Emilia and Nicholas because they were both dear to her, like family. She wasn't surprised when Amelia, blushing and looking embarrassed, confided. Melita, I'm scared. Nicholas proposed to me. Can you believe it? And he arranged for some medical specialist to examine me and see if there's any chance of improving my condition. Nicholas says he's perfectly happy with how things are, but he wants me to stop feeling sad about my limitations. You know, I feel awkward because it's as if I took Nicholas away from you, and I don't know how to express my gratitude for your generosity. Carmilla, crouching down, took Emilia's hands in her own. I'm so happy for both you and Nicholas. Don't worry, you didn't take anyone away from me. Be happy with Nicholas. Carmilla didn't regret at all that she had essentially pushed Emilia into Nicholas's capable hands. Yes, she liked him as a person, as a good, kind-hearted man, but not as a candidate for a life partner. She still missed her husband and hoped that she had fulfilled his obligations to the unfortunate, yet unbroken woman. At the wedding of her friend and Nicholas, Melita genuinely rejoiced for the newlyweds. Even though the bride still used a wheelchair, she had whispered in her ear that one of the doctors had given a rather optimistic prognosis for her treatment. Thanks to Nicholas's patronage, Carmela found a job with a decent salary. After a few years, when the pain from her husband's premature death had dulled and become less acute, she reciprocated the attentions of her colleague Marcos. Marcos endeared himself to all her relatives, and Emilia, after getting to know him, insisted. Melita, you more than anyone else deserve happiness. I swear, Jave would have told you that himself if he could. I can only call you a saint. You didn't abandon me. You paid for the nursery home. You provided me a place to stay. And you even found me a husband. Kindness should be rewarded. Marry Marcos and be happy. Carmela followed her friend's advice and moved in with her husband after the wedding. She didn't sell the little house in the village, but turned it into a summer cottage. With special care, she climbed up to the attic where she had discovered the hidden contract many years ago, a contract that had set off a chain of unexpected discoveries. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.